Welcome to English Fest. This is actually uh, the final session for this year for English Fest. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome Conrad Klaus here, who's going to talk to us today about John Keats. Um, as mentioned, we are recording the session. So once um, Conrad has finished his uh, presentation, we'll come to some questions and answers at the end. Do put any questions that you might have in the chat and you can do that as we're going along if you like as well. And then um, I can read them out to Conrad at the end. So thank you for joining us and over to you, Conrad. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sarah, and welcome all of you to English Fest 2020, which is a little bit like Glastonbury, really, but just on English literature, which, if anything, makes it better in my book. And I'm a lecturer in Romantic Period Literature at Anglia Ruskin, and I get to talk to you about Romantic Period Literature and one very interesting Romantic poet, in particular, John Keats. So what I would like to do today is tell you a little bit about what the Romantic Period was all about. Plot spoiler, it's a lot and we won't be able to cover it all, not even by a long short shot, but uh, we will be able to cover some interesting themes there that apply directly to our poet of the day, who is John Keats. You'll need a little bit of background on him, which I will be very happy to supply before you can enjoy some wonderful poetry that I've furnished on my slides as well. And that may get you uh, to be a real Keats fanboy or fangirl in the way that so many of us at ARU are as well. We're going to finish then this session in about, say, 35 to 40 minutes from now uh, with some tips on how you can get into poetry if you aren't already, because I know that sometimes uh, secondary school pupils are a bit reluctant to get reading first, and there really is no reason why you should be. As Sam has already said at the start of this uh, mini lecture, uh, so we do encourage you to engage uh, with what I say, uh, but I understand, of course, that you don't want to switch your mic on or perhaps even put anything in the chat. Uh, so another way for you to uh, let me know whether you agree with something or whether you uh, want to uh, participate in activities is by using the reactions function, which should be at the top of your screen. And Sarah's has already demonstrated one of those reactions, the thumbs up, which is very gratifying. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, but there's also a virtual hand there that you can raise just like you would in class, uh, which will tell me tell you indeed. Thank you, as demonstrated by my assistant, Sarah, uh, uh, which will tell me that you either have something to say or that you want to confirm something that I will be asking you about. And what I exactly mean by that will become clear very soon. So when I ask my secondary school students, uh, secondary uh, second year students, I should say at Anglia Ruskin, what their associations with romanticism are, I get all kinds of interesting answers and very rarely these are wrong. And I mean by that is that with all literary historical periods, whether it's like the Renaissance or the Romantic period, or the Victorian period, or modernism, or all kinds of different terms like that that you may have heard in your A-level courses. Uh, it's never an exact science as to how you define these. So they're usually a set of different cultural associations, like phenomena that occurred in a given period of history. Uh, and there really isn't just like one version of them. So it's often se uh, several conversations going on all at once, bickering with each other sometimes, in major conflicts and together working out what the most interesting and most important literature of the time would have been. But these are some very common associations in this nifty little word cloud that I've put on a slide here. So when I did a questionnaire with my second year students this year, these were the most popular terms that came up there. So what are your associations with the Romantic era? And the way these word clouds work, we may have seen them before, is that the most common occurrence uh, gets uh, uh, well rendered in the largest font. Uh, so you can see that nature was the most common uh, keyword that people associated romanticism with. And I think that's a very common reference that you may immediately agree with too. There's other kinds of uh, buzzwords on there that may ring a bell when you think about romanticism yourself, such as beauty and melancholy, certainly things that romantics cared about a lot. Emotions, right? So individualism, perhaps. It says there, poetry, gender, elegance, the sublime, uh, nationalism, some 
very critical students, but exaggerated, which I didn't appreciate, but we're all entitled to our own opinions. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of kind of lofty involved rhetoric in Romantic era literature that sometimes makes students feel a little bit taunted by it but you get used to it. And a good way uh, to get used to it is to turn first to those poets who perhaps aren't overly challenging, a little bit more accessible. And I think that Keats is a prime example of these. A little bit about the Romantic period though. So I said it's very difficult to define any given period in literary history. Uh, but uh, when we talk about the Romantic period at university and in your A-level course books as well, we mean a period that roughly runs from the 1780s to the 1830s, which is often said to be one of the most tumultuous in British and even global cultural history because a lot happens in those 50 odd years. In the most basic sense, uh, the French Revolution is uh, kind of like the foundational event of the Romantic period. And this is something that we spend a lot of time on at uni. So wherever you uh, might end up uh, taking an English course if you're interested in that, because it's such a foundational event. So you may know a little bit about it. So you have seen films about it. I've seen it uh, referenced on TV. Uh, so the French Revolution kicked off basically in 1789 uh, when a uh, popular revolt in Paris uh, stormed the Bastille prison and eventually that resulted in a huge kind of like political upheaval in this country that sent shockwaves through the establishment throughout Europe and indeed the world. Right, so I often tell my students this was like World War Zero in a way, because every single place on this planet was impacted in one way or another. And what was so shocking about it to people was that this event actually showed that in a very short amount of time you could have a complete turnover of uh, the way things were done. Right? So uh, not only as to how the country was run, so you may know about the French Revolution that the kings of France, the king of France was taken down the peg and eventually even executed, uh, but also the way that people thought about all kinds of different uh, truths that had before been taken for granted. Right. So like the place of women in society, the relationship between working class people and the upper classes and the aristocracy, the role of religion in society. All of these things were suddenly questioned and that made people aware that whatever seemed fixed in society may not have had to be. Right. So if you wanted to change things, you could. And that was very inspiring to them and in, and uh, gave rise to this interest in some of the buzzwords that we've seen on the previous slides, like individualism and conflict and revolution. So whatever seemed to be taken for granted before no longer was and people started questioning things and their own place in society. This coincides with uh, a questioning in reason. And this may sound like a weird thing to you, but uh, if you know anything about like uh, the history of science and you've heard about people like Newton, for instance, you know, with the apple falling on his head, uh, which allowed him to discover uh, allegedly uh, gravity, which would have happened actually just well, you can't see where I'm pointing at, but about 200 meters in that direction from where I'm sitting right now in Cambridge. So that's a bit of local history for you. Uh, and the, pe the period before the Romantic period, which was Newton's period, was characterized by this huge boom in scientific experiment, which made people a little bit cocky, actually. So they assumed that uh, they could pour everything into numbers and establish like uh, universally applicable laws to just about everything. And this period of upheaval, the Romantic period, it also started questioning that. So maybe all of those old uh, securities that we've had, including uh, what we can tell and, uh, and predict about society, aren't actually as fixed as they seem to be. And we should spend more time questioning what we think of the world and how we relate to what people tell us. So that's another very important theme of the Romantic era. With that came a kind of like questioning of uh, the uh, self evidence of the nature of like material progress, right? So when we talk about the uh, revaluation of emotions and our uh, personal responses to the world, 
uh, we also have to think about like uh, the place of uh, individuals in society, as I said before. And the Romantic period saw this huge boom in the cities of Britain of uh, industrial uh, technology and labor which in many ways brought prosperity, but not prosperity to everyone. I right? just like a few chosen uh, lucky few people had the money uh, and made the investments uh, because for the majority of the population at that time, it made life a lot more difficult. Whereas they used to have had very modest lives on farms, for instance, they would now be forced to take uh, hired labor in uh, in the major industrial centers of, of Britain. So especially places like Birmingham, for instance, later Manchester and also London. Uh, and uh, this gave uh, this caused a important kind of like drop in people's quality of living as well. Uh, made many more people live just below the poverty line, as it were, and have to live in very squalid conditions. So in the Romantic period, people also start looking at that with more criticism and realizing that what we left behind, that uh, allegedly less advanced world of pre-industrial Britain, was actually not all too bad there. It may not have been as exciting as uh, the buzz of like scientific breakthrough that characterized uh, those vibrant industrial hubs uh, dotted across the country, but people may have been happier in those modest times uh, and we may need to rethink our relationship to uh, concepts like progress, for instance. Now, I said before that literary history is never an exact science, so you can't just define a period in history. It's not like everybody in the Victorian period, for instance, thought the same. Uh, not at all, actually, there were major conflicts there. Uh, and uh, when you name a period, there always has to be some kind of a consensus there, right? It's always something you can question and, uh, and, and maybe formulate an alternative to. And it's important to know that like romantic is a label that was only affixed to this period in hindsight. So the romantics themselves would be very offended if you call them romantics because it was a term that they used, not perhaps as a term of abuse, but at least uh, it wasn't very positive. So somebody who was romantic in, in the romantic period itself would be somebody who dreamed a lot. It was uh, not very realistic and grounded in everyday reality, perhaps. But in a way, that was exactly what these people were about because they were allowing themselves to uh, let their imaginations run wild sometimes about like, what could be possible. Uh, also questioning uh, what everybody around them took for granted. So it's a very ambiguous kind of like label uh, that stuck to them eventually and became this very known moniker that we talk about still in the 21st century. So that's a little bit uh, for the, about the romantics for you. Uh, and all of the things that we just talked about and many more apply to the so-called big six. Now, this is a concept uh, that if you were to study English at university, you'd have to tackle yourself as well, uh, because we often talk uh, these days about like how people in the past, and I mean like say most of the 19th and 20th century, when they discussed uh, literature of the Romantic and Victorian and earlier periods, uh, that they tend to have a bit of a blinkered view about who was worth reading. So for the longest time, say until the 1970s, 80s, maybe even, uh, there was this consensus at university that you should only read six people. So I can tell you already that all six of these were male and white. You won't be surprised to hear, uh, but maybe you've heard of them. Right. So like it's an interesting kind of like uh, kind of like uh, exercise, perhaps uh, to uh, to see if you can uh, work out by these rebuses who these people were. You get John Keats for free and I won't put you on the spot by making you making you, uh, you read out your solutions. But why don't you take 20 seconds to work out the names on the slides there on the slide? In the meantime, I'll give you some hints that may help you. So our first mysterious poet there uh, was born in the middle of the 18th century and was associated with the French Revolution and the wildest kind of like visions about what this event could mean for Britain and the world. He writes uh, deceptively simple poetry, 
uh, that uh, is beloved by students actually uh, every every single year that I teach him. Uh, and I think that some of you may be reading him for your A levels or may already have for GCSE. Uh, so you may have heard of poet one from there. Poet two was in his own lifetime the most famous romantic poet, huge bestseller. It was a so-called poet laureate, eventually, so the official national poet uh, of the United Kingdom. And he's often associated with the Lake District. Poet number three was born in London, but a good friend of uh, said uh, poet number two from the Lake District there, so often also called a Laker. Uh, and he wrote a very influential book of poetry together with number two that was first published in 1798. And uh, you know some poems from this collection. So that's a bit of a giveaway. And yeah, so uh, somebody in the chat had just pointed out that number three has stumped them and he may be the least obvious, but uh, you'll recognize the name when I tell you. Number four is a, a very famous and flamboyant poet, poet, and I'll give you this hint. He was married to the author of Frankenstein. Number five was a mate of his and of the author of Frankenstein, uh, a very uh, dashing aristocratic poet. And that first name there, the first word, isn't actually his uh, name, but his title. And then you got Keats for free. So let's see if uh, what you came up with there. Uh, mysterious visionary number one was, of course, William Blake. The Lake uh, poet number two that was so famous in his own period and was the major bestseller of his age was William Wordsworth. Number three, that, that the most mysterious of all, perhaps, the rhyme of the ancient mariner was his major poem, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Number four, the uh, frilly blouse wearing uh, dandy Percy Bish Shelley. Number five, his pal, uh, kind of a rock star of his age, Lord Byron. So these people were the so-called big six, which means that those were the ones that you had to read at uni uh, if you uh, studied uh, or if you read English any time between 1850, which is when people start studying English at university roughly in this country, up until, say, the 1970s. And only then do we start questioning whether there wasn't perhaps more to literature of this period than, uh, than we previously thought so you will discover when you look at it, this, for instance, you'll see that, as I said before, so they're all white, but that's sadly normal, right? So for like older conceptions of, uh, of English literature, when you come to university, you will actually read people of color as well. Uh, so including from the Romantic period, because there's some very important commentators uh, on events at that time uh, who uh, make their case in, uh, in very, uh, persuasive and moving rhetoric as well about issues like slavery that they experienced firsthand. Uh, and there's also no women on here, right? Because, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, right? So there were hundreds and hundreds of famous female authors of the time, but something happened called the Great Forgetting around the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, where critics started uh, to uh, work out what's often called a canon, so a list of works that you should remember and what isn't in there you could safely forget about. And uh, they decided that uh, nothing written by women was of like enduring quality. So uh, it would have all have been very topical and connected to its very specific moment in time. So not worth remembering, really. Now, it goes to uh, goes without saying that when you get to university, we will dispel that myth really quickly by pointing out that uh, in their own period. So all of these six poets there uh, would have uh, had major contenders in in female poets and also novelists. Uh, of that period. Jane Austen, of course, is the most famous, but there are many, many others, and you would get to discover them at university as well. So Keats is the one that we are here to talk about this morning. Uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody has read any Keats, whether for A-level perhaps, or GCSE, or just out of private interest. If you have, could you uh, hover your mouse over the reactions button and uh, uh, raise your hand? So that won't make you tell me 
which ones you've read, which poems you've read, but just like seeing your hands will already be very helpful. So we've got one person already. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's just about all of you, apparently. That's great indeed. So I can please to see that Keats is still uh, quite famous and important. And uh, well, yeah, the big six endure, don't they? So it's not because we uh, want to expand that kind of view, but we're supposed to be reading from the Romantic period. So bring in more people of a less obvious uh, social backgrounds who were also important back then. That doesn't mean that we have to stop reading these guys, right? These guys are amazing. Uh, and John Keats uh, should definitely be uh, getting a place on your nightstand and uh, at home as well. So he's wonderfully readable and we'll, in a moment uh, when I get the bi biography sorted, we'll read some of his stuff uh, to prove this to you if you were been convinced already. So John Keats uh, is together with Byron and Shelley, uh, probably the most popular second generation romantic, right? So they're often divided into two generations. There's the guys who were very popular or very active already in the 1790s. William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And then there's the younger generation, often not at all pleased with old guys, uh, Byron Shelley Keats, uh, who are born a little bit later and uh, shape the literature of the early 19th century. So Keats has a, a kind of like uh, an, uh, a challenging background there that uh, has colored his reception, so the way that people read his poetry already when he was alive, and it's maybe also the reason why we're still so much in, into him uh, today. So Keats, in, uh, unlike the other poets in our list, was not a so-called gentleman, right? So what is a gentleman? You can tell by the ironic way that I pronounced it, that it's not an obvious category either. It's one of the things that romantics started questioning. So it would be somebody uh, from uh, a privileged uh, social situation, so upper middle class and uh, uh, and gentry, essentially, like so long, uh, low ranking uh, hereditary, uh, not always aristocracy, but at least people with like a landed interest and uh, who uh, got their money uh, from uh, bygone generations. Uh, so Keats was actually the son of an ostler. That's the first of two vanished uh, professions that I may need to explain a little bit. So an ostler was uh, somebody who attended to horses, right? So uh, his father uh, specifically worked in a big inn uh, near Moorgate in London, uh, which was back then not as uh, sophisticated as it is today. So it was a working class neighborhood and kind of like as the word Keats already uh, tells you like an area where you would arrive uh, in the city at right so like from uh, what was still then mostly countryside uh, around it and uh, so that this he was not an upper class person at all right so the Keatses weren't poor exactly uh, but they definitely uh, weren't posh uh, and uh, it uh, shows a, a, a little bit about like the intellectual ambitions that there not, nevertheless were in this family uh, that they did uh, send him out to be trained as a surgeon apothecary. Uh, now, this is a very kind of like confusing uh, job that uh, uh, that people sometimes uh, are amazed by that it wasn't the university thing. So like uh, nowadays, when you go to uh, well, when you want to be a doctor, for instance, uh, so when you do all the things that uh, physicians do today, then you need to go to uni because it's a very complex uh, and very risky perhaps pursuit. Uh, and you need to know what you're on about before you can lay hands on any of your patients. Back in the day, no, right? So it was something that you picked up as a trade essentially there. So in the same way as like you, you, you uh, go to like become an apprentice to a blacksmith, uh, like uh, if you wanted to be a doctor uh, or, an, uh, or like uh, an assistant to a doctor, you'd essentially uh, get some basic training in one way or another uh, and at colleges and then uh, very quickly on uh, become an apprentice to a practitioner who would show you the ropes just by taking you out on uh, his, at that point, roots. Right? So there were two different ways of being a medical practitioner back then. So you could either be a doctor and people would call you doctor and you would have lots of prestige because you, yeah, you help them not of die, which is a big thing, especially in the period where there's so many things that can make you ill. Uh, but uh, there's also kind of like a second degree of physician uh, uh, in this period called the surgeon apothecary, uh, who would do things like draw teeth. Uh, they would uh, like uh, uh, make uh, like they were chemists as well, so they 
compound like medicine for you. So if you had a headache, you went to see them as well, and they would uh, like yeah, pound some herbs together and then give you a, a, a painkiller or something like that. Or they would do very basic uh, medical uh, like uh, procedures like bloodletting. Right, so which is the cure all of that period. So like, uh, I feel a little bit faint. Yeah, let's tap some blood from you. Or like, uh, I was sick this morning. Yes, I think you have too much blood. So that's kind of like the consensus. And so surgeon apothecaries would be sent for rather than doctors who've got other stuff to do, babies to deliver, kind of like surgery to perform. And then your John Keats would knock on your door and help you out with that. Now, this is not a very prestigious uh, position. I'm sure that we've all have been very grateful for people like Keats to help us uh, but at least with like uh, uh, some of the quack medicine that they sometimes had to offer. Uh, but uh, but generally, you wouldn't get a lot of prestige uh, or like a, like a respect from the local landowners if you were a mere surgeon apothecary. So he wasn't a gentleman. He was educated quite well, but by our standards, perhaps, but not by the standards of the time. So uh, my students are often surprised when they hear that like almost everybody in England could read it this point right so and this may sound like duh obvious i can read and of course you can you can read because you've got such a wonderful education system behind you uh, but already in at this early point uh, like most people would have been literate in 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 the uk to some extent specifically in england this comes from like uh, like initiatives like sunday schools that really come up in the in the late 18th century that uh, taught like uh, even like uh, kids in the countryside like uh, from from uh, them would have been called peasants or like low ranking farmers to read the Bible, for instance. And if you can read the Bible, you can also read literature, which they did to some extent, or read the newspaper and magazines. So this country was rarely literate at this point. And so uh, somebody like Keats, who uh, on top of that went to secondary school, basically, uh, would also have been very well versed in uh, in uh, in our history, for instance, uh, known quite a lot about like science before he even went into like training to become a surgeon apothecary and uh, uh, get a lot of like uh, modern what was then called modern literature right so like uh, important like works from across Europe essentially he would have had a little bit of modern language as well maybe like a smattering of Italian French and German uh, so like uh, he genuinely wasn't uneducated uh, I always say that like uh, uh, self-consciously perhaps I think that like a 20 year olds from the back on that Keats has a that it would have been roughly as educated as I am and I, I have a PhD right so I'm supposed to be very clever <laughs> so it's, it's it's interesting to see we, we shouldn't uh, berate these romantics uh, for what they knew but importantly he had not been to university right so because uh, his parents couldn't afford it uh, and people just didn't right so unless you were of a certain background or could secure uh, like a grant that would ca carry you through. So, and this is really important for him, he doesn't speak Latin or Greek, right? So qualifications for an intellectual back then. You were basically uh, considered to be a hick if you couldn't, uh, well, cite Plato off the top of your head, right? So different times, luckily. Uh, but that didn't let Keats uh, uh, stop him uh, from uh, contributing to uh, magazines in his time. So he discovered very early on reading those literary classics from all over Europe. So like uh, he's very into romances. So like uh, adventure tales, basically, from uh, from uh, the, the 15th and 16th century, which are really popular at the time. You may have read some Spencer for your uh, for your A-level, for instance, there. So uh, or some of the authors that inspired Shakespeare tales, uh, Shakespeare plays like uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, all of those are romances, basically. Uh, and that starts writing poetry of his own and immediately gets bullied by critics. So he gets bullied for several reasons. So often uh, people focus on the fact that there's all this class snobbery where critics say, well, you're not a gentleman. You shouldn't be writing poetry. Uh, what do you know of uh, of literature? You don't even read Greek, right? So it's an often uh, 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 an allegation that he often had to endure, but also because he uh, was really committed to progressive politics or like reform of society as so many romantics were. And he contributed to uh, very uh, radical magazines uh, and uh, the critics on the other side of the political spectrum, so conservatives, had a go at him all the time uh, because they like he is the champion of those uh, radical reformists, uh, like an, a mere surgeon apothecary. Uh, so uh, nobody that we should actually take seriously. 
His reputation was helped, uh, ironically, of course, by a very sad event, the fact that he died at 26 of tuberculosis. Uh, so as uh, many people still did back then, uh, and this is one of those great tragedies of romantic era literature. So everybody always speculates about like what would Keats have uh, been able to do if he had lived longer, right? So we've only got these very uh, youthful effusions, as they were called back then. So like uh, his, his first uh, attempt, basically, at writing verse. Uh, and if these are already so great, what may, may he not have done had he been older, right? So like, I'll live to be older. So like, it's it's uh, like a common curse of that second generation. So Byron dies in his late 20s, Shelley uh, is at uh, Shelley as well. Uh, so they tended to die tragically young and that's become part of that romantic myth, as it were. So we'll look at some examples of Keats's writing in a minute, but uh, he's probably most famous, I suppose, by uh, from this ma uh, major quip from Ode on the Grecian Urn, uh, I think a GCSE level poem, it was a few years ago anyway, uh, which ends uh, on that famous line, beauty is truth, be truth, beauty. Right. So which sums up uh, what he believed in quite well. So whereas uh, university educated poets often would like flaunt their learning, right, and try to show off all that they knew, uh, Keats uh, is more focused on direct appreciation of the world around him, tries to see the beauty in there and feels that if he can make a connection to the beauty of everyday reality and just uh, uh, appreciate how magical everything is that we take for granted every day, uh, then we will lead fulfilling lives. So that's the highest kind of like uh, value that you can aspire to, because if you are content in your surroundings by discovering that you live in this beautiful paradise that you take for granted every year, every day, you're also going to be nicer to your fellow human beings uh, and everybody will get on splendidly. So that's uh, what he focuses on in his poetry rather than references to the classics or to, uh, uh, as I said, to book smart. Right? So it's this direct appreciation of the world around him. And that's why people often still read him today, uh, because he uh, can be a wonderful pick me up. Right. So you can take Keats with you into any surrounding and uh, kind of like look at the world with a fresh pair of eyes after. Here's another very famous passage from his long poem Endymion, which was published in 1818, and that kicks off immediately with another Keats line that you may uh, have seen before, right? A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bower quiet for us, and they sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. Therefore, on every morrow, are we wreathing a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of despondence of the inhuman dearth of noble natures, of the gloomy days, of all the unhealthy and o'er darkened ways made for our searching. Yes, in spite of all, some shape of beauty moves away the pool from our dark spirits. Now, that's already kind of like an application of that uh, axiom that uh, dogma that we saw on the previous slide there, truth is beauty, beauty, truth, right? So a thing of beauty is also a joy forever. This shows you what Keats's outlook was like perfectly, I think, uh, because he tells us here that the real purpose that we have in life is to read a flowery band to bind us to the earth, right? Which means that we have to recognize the beauty in whatever we encounter in our day-to-day -day realities, appreciate the beauty of the seasons, as he says in other poems, uh, uh, because that uh, shows uh, us our place in this world amongst like the whole of creation and makes us feel at home in it. Right. So we are so often uh, kind of like caught in our own minds uh, with like the cares of like society pressing on us uh, continuously. And it can be very stressful, especially like in this modern age where there's always some claim on your attention and uh, often depressing information. Well, yeah, keeps bombarding you at every point. Uh, so Keats is kind of like the poet of mindfulness, if you will. Right. So you can read him uh, to take a moment uh, away from all of that. Uh, and uh, to discover that in spite of all of this, if you appreciate uh, your natural surroundings specifically, or may just even like uh, the interactions you have with your fellow human beings, then this will uh, be a cause for celebration and uh, a comfort in our often hard lives. 
So whereas other poets may give you philosophy and all kinds of like difficult metaphysical doctrines, uh, simple old apoth uh, apothecary surgeon Keats uh, makes you appreciate beauty, but that's actually not too poor a gift at all, I think, right? So uh, we all need a bit more of that in our lives. Keats often uh, is also read not just as a poet, but also as a great lover. Right, so like the first thing that I have to tell my first year students, actually, uh, because I also uh, have the honor of, and the pleasure of teaching a kind of like introduction to English literary history at ARU, uh, is that they shouldn't confuse capital R romantic with uh, with lowercase romantic. Right, so like how we use in our everyday lives, uh, like uh, if you talk to your boyfriends or girlfriends uh, and call them romantic and appreciate their romantic nature, you're probably not thinking of the capital R definition that we just talked about before. They're not going to start a revolution, are they? Uh, but they may be uh, very open about like how much they love you and how much they uh, emotionally relate to you and what you mean to them on a very personal level. And in that case, perhaps they are at least as romantic as uh, Keats or Wordsworth or all of the others were. Uh, so he was very uh, famously uh, in love, uh, it's become part of the Keats myth, with uh, another kind of like lower middle class girl called Fanny Braun. Uh, uh, who uh, he lived in the in the Braun household bit as a lot for a bit as a lodger and they hit it off almost instantly and uh, most editions of his poetry will have as like an appendix like a selection from their love letters as well so like it's Keats's that we that we've kept and you will see how tumultuous and devoted a lover that he really was from this little excerpt here. My sweet Fanny, will your heart never change? My love, will it? I have no limit now to my love. Your note came in just here. I cannot be happier away from you. Tis richer than argosy of pearls. Do not threat me even in jest. I've been astonished that men could die martyrs for religion. I've shuddered at it. I shudder no more. I could be martyred for my religion. Love is my religion. I could die for that. I could die for you. My creed is love and you are its only tenet. You've ravished me away by a power I cannot resist, and yet I could resist till I saw you. And even since I've seen you, I have endeavoured often to reason against the reasons of my love. I can do that no more. The pain would be too great. My love is selfish. I cannot breathe without you. Oh, wow. Right? So I think we would all, maybe not after the first date, uh, but a little bit into the relationship, we all be happy to receive a text message like that. <laughs> or an email perhaps. This uh, famous relationship of theirs, as I said, has become the stuff of legends, right? So like everybody's been swooning over this for 150 years now and longer. Uh, and it's uh, been immortalized by him uh, in a movie uh, not too long ago called Bright Star, which was named after this poem, where he also reflects on his love for Fanny Braun. So they're severed, they're away from each other for a while. And of course, as no constant lover could, he uh, uh, he can't bear that, and he uh, questions indeed, like the fact that, like, uh, like interrogates, like the effect that she has on him, uh, and uh, what the, how this makes him feel. It dresses it there the uh, North Star, which is constant or steadfast, right? So if you've ever looked at a night sky, you know what I'm talking about. Bright star, I wish I were steadfast as thou art. Not in lone splendour hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart like nature's patient sleepless eremite the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores o oh, gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors no yet still steadfast still unchangeable pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft fall and swell awake forever in a sweet unrest still still to hear her tender taken breath and so live ever or else swoon to death. Very intense po a poem once again, and also one that doesn't shy away from sensuality, right? So uh, I don't need to spell out for you what it means to be pillowed upon my fair love's whitening breast. Uh, you can figure that out for yourselves, uh, but you can imagine that some of the more prudish critics uh, uh, as they often were on the conservative side back then, uh, would have been a little bit alarmed by this. Uh, and Keats's sensuous nature is often disparaged in reviews at the time and lauded today. <laughs> 
So this is the poster for that film. It's beautiful. You should see it. Uh, it stars uh, Ben Whishaw, which is often all of the encouragement that people need. Uh, he's on Netflix again in a completely different series, but the man can do everything. Uh, and so can his co-star, Abby Cornish. Uh, so this film, 2009, you'll find it uh, everywhere. I'm not going to recommend you to do anything illegal, but uh, but it's out. it's out there. And it's directed by Australian... Uh, genius uh, director Jane Campion. Uh, so it's it's worthwhile looking into uh, and it has some poetry in there, read out by Ben Wish also a lot more uh, inspiringly than I ever could. Part of that film focus also on the tragedy of his early death, of course, because that's one of the reasons why people still know and love him today. And uh, so we will need to look uh, for a little bit now at why he uh, like, yeah, it's, it's still wet today. As I said before, like one reason is is the fact that he died so tragically. And uh, the Keith Smith would have it that this death was, uh, of course, caused by uh, tuberculosis, but precipitated by the bad reception that he received in his own day, specifically by those powerful conservative critics who hated him, not only for his uh, liberal politics, but also for his class profile. The fact that they considered him to be an upstart who spoke up where he should remain silent and listen to the actual intellectuals, right? that he claimed a role in this big debate that is romantic era literature. His friend, or let's say perhaps mentor, because they definitely weren't considered equals, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, so Shelley was a, a very, uh, like, a, a bit upper class person. So per Shelley's father was a member of parliament and the baronet. Uh, so like uh, uh, the lowest, uh, like, uh, kind of like, uh, or like the highest commoner, basically there, right? So right below aristocracy, there's somebody with a lot of money, essentially. Uh, so when Keats died, wrote uh, in his honor an elegy, so a poem celebrating a deceased person uh, on the death of John Keats called Adonais, uh, which Shelley considered uh, himself considered to be his best poem ever, right? So that says a lot there about like what Keats uh, and what happened to Keats meant to him. So Keats died of TB in Rome in 1821 and Shelley very quickly after that finishes uh, this uh, very uh, uh, strong and very emotional lament for him. And he states there are uh, Adonais, so Adonais being Keats, has drunk poison. Oh, what deaf and viperous murderer could crown life's early cup with such a draught of woe. Now, the early cup, of course, there, because Keats uh, was not even 26 when he passed away. So that's a very early time to die, of course. Very, very sad. Uh, but who were these deaf and viperous murderers who allegedly would have poisoned his cup? So uh, made his life unbearable for him and thereby... Uh, uh, fast, uh, like uh, increased his decline and precipitated his early demise. Well, according to Keats's friends, uh, so uh, I'll return to that picture in a moment. Uh, it was mainly those hostile critics, and this is kind of like a taste of like the sort of like uh, like uh, disparagement that Keats had to endure, right? So, like from the major critics of his day, this is from a long review uh, written by a conservative critic called John Gibson Lockhart. You don't really need to know who that is, but uh, he wrote for a publication that was basically the sworn enemy of the one that Keats was associated with. So Keats uh, gets a hatchet job by uh, this uh, conservative critic. Uh, for several reasons. First of all, that he's associated with the wrong political side, uh, but also, as you will quickly be able to tell, uh, because he wasn't the right sort, according to this snobbish critic. Of all the manias of this mad age, the most incurable as well as the most common seems to be no other than the metromanie, so like the mania for composing verse. Turning the heads of we know not, how, know not how many farm servants and unmarried ladies, a very footman composed tragedies, and there's scarcely a superannuated governess in the island that does not leave a roll of lyrics behind. To witness the disease of any human understanding, however feeble, is distressing, but the spectacle of an able mind reduced to a state of insanity is, of course, ten times more afflicting. It is with much uh, sorrow as this that we have contemplated the case of Mr. John Keats, 
This young man appears to have received from nature talents of an excellent, perhaps even of a superior order, talents which, devoted to the purposes of any useful profession, must have rendered him a respectable, if not an eminent citizen. His friends, we understand, destined him to the career of medicine, and he was bound apprentice some years ago to a worthy apothecary in town. But all has been undone by a sudden attack of the malady to which we have eluded. So you can tell how they're setting all this up. So Keats is said to be, well, of the same kind of order as farm servants and in a sexist way, unmarried ladies, right? So all people who had, didn't have business writing poetry because what were they even write about, right? So like uh, they had no ed proper education, so they didn't have the materials essentially, and they didn't have kind of like uh, the, uh, they didn't speak proper, right? So how would they be able to rhyme properly uh, in turn? So the review then gives several examples that we don't have to go into of like a allegedly bad poetry in Keats's work uh, and finishes in a very sarcastic manner. And you'll forgive me laughing because this is so outrageous that I think it's actually funny. Uh, and Keats won in the end, remember, right? Because we read him still and nobody reads Lockhart. Uh, it is a better and a wiser thing to be a starved apothecary than a starved poet. So back to the shop, Mr. John, back to plasters, pills and ointment boxes, etc. But for heaven's sake, young Sangrado, so red-blooded person basically, be a little more sparing of extenuatives and soporifics in your practice than you have been in your poetry. So wonderfully sake there. And uh, I always say, if you're going to be evil, you might as well be funny while doing so. So I said, like, the critic there, of course, uh, made life difficult for Keats. Uh, to be fair, like, we know from letters that he left behind, he wasn't actually that much bothered by this because he knew how the game worked, right? So he knew that he uh, he was going to get, like, uh, an unfair treatment in the rival press on the other side of the political spectrum. He knew that was going to happen. Uh, but still, of course, uh, it's, it's difficult when you have to make a name for yourself and people don't take you seriously uh, on the base of your education. So that smarted a little bit at least, right? So he knew that he wasn't getting a fair deal there. But he wasn't daunted by this uh, at all. So like when Shelley says that like it was the critics who killed him, that's not exactly true. And it's another famous contemporary Lord Byron commented on this, right? So like we shouldn't take this Keats myth too seriously. It helped him become a famous poet throughout the ages, but still Byron says it best perhaps a year later and says, Ironically, John Keats who was killed off by one critique just as he really uh, promising, uh, really promised something great, if not intelligible, without Greek contrived to talk about the gods of late, much as they might have been supposed to speak. Poor fellow, his was an untoward fate. The strange the mind that very fiery particle should let itself be snuffed out by an article. Right. So, of course, Byron is also being very snobbish here towards young Keats, uh, but at least he's being a bit more realistic because he realizes that nobody actually dies from a bad review. Right. They might might hurt a little bit. I've had a fair few in my day, uh, but uh, nobody has uh, passed away from them. So it's important that when we read Keats that we don't patronize them by perpetuating this myth. Right. So I think that's very important because the poetry speaks for itself. And I'd like to finish on this one here. So uh, to tell you just uh, how much Keats got out of uh, reading literature, uh, and uh, I always like to point this out to first year students who are often a little bit nervous about like, will I be clever enough to do this? And, and the answer is yes, you will be, right? So it's a matter of application and interest, uh, and uh, Keats has both of these in spades. Uh, and uh, this poem is actually very indicative of that, I think. So it's an early one, uh, which was called, it's called On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. Now, Homer isn't Homer of Simpson fame, of course. It's the uh, great classic uh, author from ancient Greece who is uh, said to have kick-started Western literature, right? So, so 3,000 years ago, even with the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, so those works that you may have heard before, of before. And Keats, as I said before, didn't have any Greek, so he wouldn't be able to read the uh, Homer in the original as his uh, disparaging critics would have been because they went to university, right? So everybody would have to be able to be well uh, to read the classics, be even well versed in them, to quote them uh, in the tavern uh, after a few pints of porter. Uh, so Keats wasn't able to do that, but he read uh, uh, Homer in translation and still loved it, 
right? So like uh, he wasn't going to be taunted by his lack of education there. He uh, was gonna, going to come, go about it some other way and uh, still get everything out of it, which uh, his uh, more uh, posh uh, interlocutors did in their own right as well. So he reads a translation of Homer, like a class, like a very famous one back then from Chapman. Chapman was a slightly later con young contemporary of Shakespeare's uh, who writes this uh, English uh, version of, of Homer, which is quite accessible, but uh, according to many, very good indeed as well in its own right. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many Western Isles, round many Western Isles have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse have I been told that deep browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like tired Cortes when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. So what I think is so amazing about this simple poem because it's a very simple poem, right? So like uh, there's a few like old uh, old timey words in there, which I've glossed for you, which uh, were already affectations in Keats' time, like that spelling of domain, right? So he get, <clears throat> gets that from old chivalric romances, but uh, we'll uh, forgive him for that uh, because he's telling us how enthusiastic he responded to a great work of literature, giving us a lit great work of literature about this. Uh, in in turn, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the very fact here is demonstrated by him that you don't have to have all of like this classical law at your fingertips in order to uh, to duly appreciate uh, literature, not only as a reader, but also as a poet building on these experiences, right? So like I teach lots of creative writers as well, because there's a, a, a joint honors program with Anglia Ruskin called Writing and English. Uh, so uh, where the students uh, get uh, half of each basically, right? So like uh, they take some modules in English literature and they uh, do their own writing as well in their other course. And uh, they often feel inspired by this as well, like because it can be done. You've got like this vast expanse, right, of like literature in front of you. And do I have to make sense of all of this? And how long will that take? And uh, how difficult will that be? Well, essentially, you take it bit by bit, right? So you uh, you just carry on and you discover it, uh, discover it at your own pace with the help of your teachers, or if you don't go to uni by yourself, and you just explore what you're interested in. And uh, like uh, all of your teachers and lectures will always give you a uh, opportunity to do so. So, so to uh, yeah to end here, this is perhaps a good slide. I think so. How do you get into poetry? Well, how did Keats get into poetry? Well, he discovered very early on that it's a bit like running, right? So like uh, I during lockdown, I started going jogging like every other day. Uh, and I hated it first. I'm still not a big fan, to you, to be fair. It's nice to have done it and to actually be doing it. Uh, but you don't start off with a half marathon, right? So, like, you'd kill yourself, right? So what you do is, like, you uh, you run for as long as you can, and you discover that, like, the next week you'll be able to run a little bit further without getting out of breath. Uh, and uh, just, like, uh, bit by bit, you'll get better at it uh, and also be able to challenge yourself a bit more. And it will be very gratifying for you because, like, a whole world will open up for you, right? So, and uh, make it makes for a very wholesome pastime. And on the mental level there, reading poetry can be a lot like this. So what I would uh, recommend that you do is start with a poetry that appeals to you, like you've read something about them, you've read like snippets of their work, perhaps uh, he, he or she interests you. So like, yeah, start from that and start with their very shortest poems there. So Keats uh, is a very forthcoming uh, author in this sense. So he's got longer works that's for in a few months, perhaps. Uh, and he's got like very short ones, which only have like a few lines. I think the shortest one will be about like eight. Uh, there's lots of sonnets, so 14 lines. They're also quite bite sized. So work up to that, right? So start with the, with the shortest ones, savor them, put the book away and then pick it up whenever you want it again. Uh, and you will actually find yourself reading longer text before you know it. Uh, and and enjoying it a lot as well. Try to forget that you're reading first. Now, uh, I tried to read the poems that we just uh, looked at uh, metrically, 
which means, of course, that uh, that black guy had to uh, recite them. Uh, but uh, this becomes second nature after a while, right? So like you don't have to pay attention to rhyme and meter if you don't want to. You can just read it as if you were reading a novel like prose, right? And after a while, uh, you'll do that automatically, right? So it won't be a chore anymore. You don't have to have the metronome next to you in order to make sense of it at all. It's not meant for that. Just think of it as any text uh, which has a specific message to convey to you. And it just does this in much more emotionally involved and interesting rhetoric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Conrad. That was really um, detailed and engaging and, and very interesting. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes for any quick questions. Um, just one from me. Would you, are there any sort of um, starter poems, for want of a better phrase, that you would recommend or any kind of anthologies of Keats? And also, would you recommend reading Keats in context with other poets or are there any kind of anthologies or things you would specifically recommend? Well, Keats actually, thank you for that question, is a is a, a great example of a poet who can be read a little bit out, out of context, right? So don't get me wrong, I'd be very bad university lecturer if I told you that context didn't matter. Uh, I believe it does uh, matter a lot. Uh, but when you first take your, uh, just dip your toe in the water, as it were, then you can actually uh, afford to, uh, to, to read the, the odd poem here and there uh, and just uh, pick the ones that you feel up to uh, and that you uh, that you are personally drawn to as well. So uh, like that poem that we just read there, like uh, on first getting into Chapman's home is actually an example of that, right? So uh, like uh, Keats himself documents how much he uh, keenly he responds to discovering this great work. Uh, he's reading it in a way out of context there because he doesn't have the original Greek. He doesn't know other stuff was written in that period or a little bit after to kind of contextualize it all. He is just letting his imagination uh, run free as stimulated by this text. And you can do that as well without like losing too much of Keats's message. And maybe if that draws you in, you'll want to wiki him anyway, right? So like that's a good place to start. Uh, or uh, read like the introduction that's furnished in most of the editions that you can find like for just a quid at like uh, any charity shop these days because uh, it's very easy to find like penguin pocket editions of Keats but you're also asking about uh, and I think there's very few bookshops that don't carry his works uh, so yeah that's a good place to start I suppose uh, there's other romantic poets, poets that you could do that to uh, arguably maybe like the young Wordsworth for instance he's also quite easy to get into because he reads he re uh, writes to be understood as well uh, but I think uh, Keats is particularly useful for this purpose so if you are a novice in uh, romantic era literature and the period interests you well yeah why not start with Keats Right. And I think we'll end on that note. Thank you very much, Conrad. That was uh, really fascinating. And, and thank you for joining us today at English Fest. Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Bye.